here we are. Another amazing episode of Outside the Studio. I'm so excited to introduce you to Kira LaForgia. Uh, Kira has a decade of experience in people operations in the corporate world. She's no stranger to the sensitive issues involved in the human side of running a business, which I am sure everyone will agree is near and dear to our hearts as listeners of Outside the Studios. Outside the Studio. Wow, I just mispronounced my own podcast name. Anyways, <laughs> so we're going to talk today about hiring, onboarding, training, managing a small business, small, but like I, I want to focus on small business. I also want to learn about your experience in the realm of multi-million dollar business management, because that's so interesting to me too, because we all have this unlimited potential for growth, right? Like how do we start, think about venture capital. How does an idea go from a seed stage to a multi-million dollar business, it starts with somebody who has an idea and a vision and a passion and a drive to create this thing. So Kira founded Paradigm to bridge the gap between corporate HR policies and the modern needs of entrepreneurs. Ding, ding, ding. This is like <laughs> exactly what I need. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So Kira, how are you today? Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Yeah, me too. I mean, you kind of just like summed up a lot of really great discussions. I wouldn't be surprised if we had to cut off before we were done talking because there is a lot that goes into our people. And I love talking to people that actually care about this. It sounds like you do. So I'm super pumped because I really hate having to convince people to care about their employees. So that's why I love working with small businesses. They they get it. Yeah. Oh, and I'm at that point. I'm at that stage where I'm still uh, like a one to three person operation. And I often ask myself this question, okay, well, when is it time to hire an employees, you know, unemployees, <laughs> when <laughs> is it time to hire employees, unemployee, you know, I think about employee number one, I just finished reading shoe dog, uh, Phil Knight's memoir. Mm. And I just found that so fascinating as he went through this like idea of just being so passionate about selling shoes, so passionate about selling shoes. He's selling it out of the trunk of his car. And then he really uh, articulately walks us through employee number one, employee number two, employee number three. And it just kind oh, of dang. has a snowball effect. And it's so interesting at that point, like I was talking about earlier, um, as an entrepreneur in that seed stage, where does it start with this passion, this interest, this like, I'm always wondering, you know, what is it that builds a successful business in the long run? I'm curious actually to to know what your thoughts are on this, having worked with everyone from the entrepreneurial side, a small business to multi-million dollar businesses, do you see a common thread of a, like a success oh, yeah. indicator? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint just one thing, but I think that when it comes down to business in general, if you aren't, and we almost got into this on accident before we started recording, but if you aren't embracing the individuality of the people that you're bringing into your circle, whether it be through mentorship, through your employees, through even your partnerships, your friendships, your family, you know, all of that stuff, if you're not embracing that authenticity and, and trying to find ways to stretch and conform your brain into adopting an inclusive and, and that mindset of everyone has value, then your business isn't going to be able to adapt and grow to the environment that we're in, especially with how quickly things are rapidly changing. So I think being able to the, the most successful people that I've seen that I've worked with or worked for have been super focused on the individuality of each of the people, but can also draw that line between what they're contributing to the business and what the business is like metrics and numbers wise profiting from that person's innate skill set so that the business needs and the people and the person are intrinsically linked so that their values and their mindset and the decisions they're making are not only kind of like this self-motivating, like kind of like a car battery thing, the more you use it, the better it works um, with the needs of the business so that people can actually be in positions to feel super connected to their work. So then we as leaders don't have to show up and motivate people like a little battery charger, but instead be able to be a soft place for people to land when they need a little bit of extra support and guidance and to speak on behalf of our business. We 
the business owners and the leaders that really can understand that connection between a person's motivation and personality and getting things that are profitable out of their people for the business needs are, it's a really tough thing to do because those are two totally different, you know, ball games at the end of the day, but people, the people that contribute to our businesses are the people that are going to make or break whether we're successful or not. Mm -hmm. So understanding that and then understanding the link and seeing it as a benefit instead of a a hindrance is a really powerful mindset to have. And a lot of us need to have that proven to us before we understand it. So our business owners that are small business owners that can grasp onto that before they need it like proven to them and start thinking in a way that's going to build out that higher level thinking structure instead of the little things like the tasks that you have to hand off or, um, you know, maybe instead of thinking about putting a bandaid on a bullet hole and instead thinking bigger and thinking about the individual strengths. Um, I mean, I know that touches on a lot of what we're going to talk about today, but I think that that's something that I've noticed that's really different from the people that find that innate success with building and scaling their business versus the people that kind of find themselves in the same place year after year. Mm. Um, and unfortunately we've encountered both, you know, sometimes we do a call with a business and then the next year we do the same call with the business and they've, they've seen it. Okay. I get it now. Mm. Like, let's do it. Let's pour into the people. Well, how do you direct them to, I'm um, like, do you think that it takes a certain skill set or characteristic to be able to even see something like that in an employee? How how do you build how do you coach a employer to see the talents? I mean, it might sound kind of like duh, you just look at what they're good at, but like <laughs> oh no, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So how do we how do we recognize that in people? Are there some tips that you could Walk us yeah. Through. Oh, for sure. This is my favorite thing to talk about. Cause of course we do mm. HR compliance. It's our special sauce. We want to make sure people have a growth plan, but they also are following the laws and that's really important. But the thing that I think really makes the biggest difference and can kind of pour gasoline on that growth mentality is understanding that you're a leader by default, but you're a management manager by choice. And so being able to step into that manager mentality and understanding that's a skill you have to hone and adapt and develop over time, you're never done learning the skill of management. And you're also never done developing yourself as an individual leader. And we have to be able to step into different roles within our own lives on the at the drop of a hat as a CEO or as an entrepreneur. And I think when you learn to kind of compartmentalize what each of those roles look like, you can also start to see that in other people. So I just say like, look in the mirror first and foremost, like take a look at yourself. What are your strengths? How can you capitalize on those? Don't read. I mean, it sounds like shoe dog might be a book I might want to read. Um, that sounds awesome, but there are a lot of really outdated leadership and management books out there that I would say I'd actually rather work with a leader that maybe hasn't dove into that whole area of learning and trying to emulate what they've seen in corporate that we've all seen be really toxic and often terrible. And instead, like really capitalize on the fact that you already have what you need, but we just need to sharpen those skills a little bit and know that it's not going to end. You're not just suddenly a great manager. Mm -hmm. Your personality is going to change. Your priorities are going to change. Your business is going to change. And being able to step into different leadership roles throughout this process is also going to be able to show you my people are doing this really well. They need more help with this. They are lacking in this area. What can I capitalize on? Versus what can I just move on to someone else? I'm not going to try to make them good at something that they don't enjoy, they don't like, and isn't really bringing me any value. So I think once you're able to turn that on yourself and see how you can step into different roles, it becomes really easy to start to see that in the people that you work with. And especially if you care about them and you get to know them and you understand what makes them tick. Yeah. That's such good advice. That has me thinking about, um, I've watched my, my husband kind of grow and, He's always been a natural leader, but he's grown a team of people um, in his role. And you just touched on it. The thing I think that makes him such a good leader and a manager is that he cares so deeply about what his employees want and what makes them happy and what lights them up and what inspires them and, you know, what they're interested in. I think if he didn't have that, like, really innate ability or desire to care and see them thrive. He just, I don't know, maybe he wouldn't be the type of manager that everyone really just looks up to. So I think that's so key. And I love that looking in the mirror first for, you know, what lights me up? Cause it's true. Like when you can see something in yourself, then you can start to see it so much more easily in others. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering 
and we're going to just like hop all over the place, but I'm thinking about <laughs> this in terms of like, I always kind of go, is this linear or not? But back to the conversation around when is it time to hire an employee, especially from the lens of a very small business who doesn't have a six figure income or who is just starting out, who maybe like, well, you can use me as an example, has left the corporate work world, uh, went from the six figure salary to uh, peanuts for lack of a better word, <laughs> and is now trying to figure out how to do all of these things to wear all of these hats and feeling like I definitely need to hire an employee. How do I do that? Is it time? I mean, usually I will say I saw, a link, I'll give an example. I saw a LinkedIn post the other day and it was, I'm like, like a hundred percent maxed out. I'm super overwhelmed. So I think it might be time to hire somebody. What do you guys think? <laughs> and somebody tagged me and they were like, I think Kira's in California. Maybe she can help you or whatever. And I think if you're getting to that point, I'm not saying it's too late because it's not, but we as CEOs, as entrepreneurs, as founders often think that we're just doing one person's job, but we're probably doing four people's job. We're probably doing three people's job. So what we're finding is that when we get those really high performing entrepreneurs that have businesses that are all different types. So like you may, if you run an in-person business, you're probably just going to need to hire right off the bat, like just get it going. Like we can build a budget that works, that makes it happen, that creates bandwidth for you to grow into a more like long-term role. You can start with part-time, you know, we just got to get it going. Like usually when it comes to in-person that's way too much weight for one person to have on their shoulders, you know, running the business every single day and not having any external support. Um, but I think that there is an element of we all wait too long. So if you don't know exactly what that person is and you can't imagine yourself hiring an employee, then the question isn't, oh, I can't hire anyone then because I can't picture what it is. It's just we need to figure out who that person is because then you start to see a lot of clarity. And I don't mean like I want them to live in my zip code and I want them to um, be really passionate about you know, the same things I like. And I want them to be a mom that has extra time. And I want them, you know, personality and I want them to be bubbly and kind and, you know, whatever, like that's all really good. And there's a time and place for that. But we're talking about the internal structure of your business and what pillar that person is going to play to hold up the structure of your business. Then it starts to become really clear when and how we're going to pursue that person. And I think most of the time entrepreneurs wait way too long because it is kind of weird, especially if you have a, anything remote or on online that you're doing within your team, it's kind of hard to like tangibly understand the amount of work and effort that you're putting in on the day to day. So pretty much everybody's waiting too long. Um, but what I will say just to kind of encourage people is that you may not know exactly who that person is, but if you're running a business and you have a consistent level of income that you're hitting every single month, it's time to start to plan for support. Mm -hmm. Unless you never, ever, ever want to have a team, then we would actually take a different approach and work on making sure your systems are in place to ensure that you have capacity limits and that you're holding those boundaries to make sure you can continue to be a solopreneur from here on out. But if your goals are to have a small team, then just even if that consistent revenue is always hitting five grand a month. Let's set a budget and figure out where you can start to get a really awesome impact from a team member and, and then start to fit that in. It doesn't necessarily have to look like what anyone else has done. And I think that can be really overwhelming if you're like, well, I need a full-time employee, $65,000 a year minimum. How am I going to afford that when I'm barely hitting 10 K months? I want to pay myself too, blah, blah, blah. We hear a lot of that. We can do it. However, works for your business. It's just about being strategic and making sure that you're reaching out to people that actually have done this before so that they can get, you can get some real advice. But if you're starting to see, oh my gosh, I just need something quick. I need somebody to help me. I need to get this off my plate, hire a couple contractors, get some tasks off your plate in the interest of building something permanent. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when it comes to that first employee, you're, you're going to pigeonhole yourself into a place where growth isn't possible um, until you decide exactly what direction that you want to go into. And you may not know what that is yet. Um, mm -hmm. And that's totally fine. You may not make the decision that it's time to hire an employee until you can actually see it. But I would usually encourage people like, I know this doesn't look super clear, but 
Um, the stories that we tell ourselves in our head all the time are usually against us getting support and help. And especially for women, it's like, put it all on your back, do it yourself. You can figure it out. You can bootstrap it. You can handle it. What else are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. Um, but not to go too far into it, but when it comes to that first employee, what, even when you're building out your offers, you should start to think about how you're going to get other people in there to help and support you to do that. Because first of all, you do deserve it. And second of all, you may not know exactly what it looks like, but you can let the employee help you figure out how it's going to feel and look once Mm -hmm. you have somebody in that can support you. It doesn't have to be perfect right away. Yeah. I love that reminder. When I was um, starting to straddle the solopreneur and corporate life, I kept, I had these little cards that I can't remember. What are they called? It's not like a tarot card. It's like a deck of cards that are like affirmations that you pull. Oh yeah. 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 I kept pulling the same one and it said every time I pull it purpose over perfect. And I love this reminder from the universe or wherever it was coming from, this little deck of manifestation cards that (laughs) we don't have to have it all figured out before we start our website or launch our podcast. Like we will learn and evolve and and change as we go. I love that reminder. I'm Mm. I'm wondering, um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about this idea that we how do we figure out who that employee is? Like if it's our first employee or second employee, setting aside personality. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like I need an executive assistant. I need a copywriter, you know, whatever it is. How do we figure out who that person is? So I think what you just said there, which was kind of titling it first, what is not what we want to do. So instead we want to say, what do I want to do? Like, what do I want to actually offload to someone else? What do I feel comfortable training somebody else to do in a couple of hours? What do I know needs to get done? It's an absolute imperative thing that I know has to get done in the functionality of my business. I generally say to start with re recurring tasks. So if you have a newsletter that goes out, drop that on the list from there, we're actually going to craft a job description and then mirror the title based on what is actually, what actually you need. And that's why, yes, we do sell job description templates and things like that, but they're meant to be a jumping off point because everybody's job description for their business should look a little bit different. And I think that trying to fit in a box is going to create a situation where you're like, Oh, well, the job description said I have to have them managing my SOP library, but I don't know what an SOP is. So now I have to go build an SOP library before I get help. It's like, no, your to-do list is already too long. Let's write down all the things that they need. Then we can actually reverse engineer that into the time that it's going to take, the title it is. And then once we have the title, we can figure out how much it's going to cost either on an hourly basis or something like that. So then you can decide against your budget how that's going to work with your eventual goals. If we're talking about potentially, let's just say, for example, a yoga studio. So let's say you have somebody that you know you need to have... um, yoga teachers that are coming in and teaching classes in your studio in order to make sure that you can constantly be having a return on the investment of your rent and the people coming into the building and to serve your population a little bit better and to give better customer service. It's not just like, oh, well, Tessa doesn't need to teach every single class, but it's more so in the sense of like, how can we better create a footprint for our business instead of how can we better create a footprint for Tessa to teach? Mm -hmm. And once you switch that mindset a little bit, then you can start to calculate that that scalable role in your business business is going to be that yoga teacher. The more yoga teachers you have, the more people that you can serve. So that means the more money that the the business is going to be able to bring in because they're going to be able to serve more and more students or clients or however you want to, whatever you want to call it. So there is a scalable role option, and then there's a more operational assistant or administrative type role option. And so I think that depending on what your business is, if you're for that first employee, it's usually one of the two, somebody that's going to open up the floodgates for you to bring in more clients. If you have a wait list, or if you have people that are trying to pay you money, but there's no way for them to fit in, or if you have no time, like time is a huge limitation for you to deliver on services or products, then the scalable role option is going to be the direction that we're going to move. We're going to try to create bandwidth within your business. That's going to efficiently make you more money. Whereas the operation side of thing is it's like, I don't have time to offer the best possible service. Service. I don't have time to teach the classes that I need to teach to make more money. I don't have time to train my employees because I'm doing all this operational stuff, or I don't have time to do anything I want to do because I'm trying to figure out this stupid funnel system or something like that. <laughs> then we're going to lean more on a investment in a person that's going to help you with the operational side with the intention that both of these roles are probably going to be one or the other is going to come first, but they're probably going to be a simultaneous hire for your business that is going to help you build a team. I think if you're a solopreneur, 
guarantee that you can have two people coming in with two different sets of skill sets that are going to exponentially grow your business within months because you're going to be able to open up the space in which to serve people and collect their money. And then you're going to open up the time in which you can contribute to adding sales and value and art revenue generating activities to your business. So it just kind of depends on what's going to free up the time a little bit more quickly for you and what your business needs, but it's usually going to be one of those roles. Identifying the scalable role in your business may be a little bit more difficult if it's not so straightforward as, you know, a yoga studio. For example, if you're a graphic designer, your scalable role that brings in clients and delivers templates or, you know, custom services or something like that, you may have a graphic design, a graphic designer that comes in and that's your scalable role. For us, our scalable role is our HR consultants because we can serve more people the way that our offers are built if we have more consultants that can work on the businesses. So that's our scalable role. But that doesn't necessarily mean that your operations or your administrative person isn't also making you money. It just might not be as direct of an impact. So depending on the business, you may be like, well, I actually need to hire some more um, administrative type help because I need to get some things off my plate so that I can sell more. So then I do need the scalable role. So it's just, it's usually one of those two roles, whether you're in person or whether you're, um, online or you have a remote team or some combination of both, it's usually one of those two. Um, but it really does depend on the CEO and the type of leader you want to be, the offers that you have, the type of business that you want to have in order to really say what that's going to look like. Um, and, and your personality, you know, you might be like, Hey, I actually want to be out there teaching classes 20 hours a day, but I can teach six more classes in a week and make myself you know, 12,000 more dollars in a week. If I, I don't know if that even makes sense, but um, 12,000 more dollars in a week, if I don't have to worry about the bookings or the cancellations or the facilities maintenance or the bathroom toilets clogged or the, you know, calling back future clients or placing me on podcasts or podcast editing, like all these things that you're doing to help rev- like generate that revenue for your business. So it really does also matter what you want to do. Cause otherwise you're not going to want to do your job and we need you to like your job. <laughs> So true. I'm also thinking about this from the lens of the, the, have you heard this term, the multi-hyphenate where it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, so, okay. So full disclosure, I'm a multi-hyphenate. Like I've gotten certification after certification after certification. And now I have a uh, certification in health coaching. I teach yoga and meditation. I'm a Reiki practitioner. These things all have some overlap in terms of like healing and wellness and health and well-being, but it's it's almost like, okay, now it's time to stop getting certifications and let's put something together that's a cohesive offering that really aligns with you and your ethos and why you've studied all of these things. How do we make it make sense to the the people that we're trying to serve. So do you work with uh multi-hyphenates? I'm using that in quotes <laughs> in terms of like <laughs> Um, helping them develop strategy around how to create an offering in the first place. Yeah, we love that. I mean, of course, we we generally have three different types of clients that come in or three different types of business owners. And so I'll use you as an example, just based on this brief amount of information I have. But we have one client that is maybe they they need their HR compliance in order. They need a handbook. They want company policies. They know growth is down the road, but really they need one person that's an employee because of legal reasons. Mm-hmm. They need somebody in their business operations. They need to classify them correctly and they want to make sure they're doing it right. We have another client that may have a few different contractors they're working with, but they know they're right at that cusp. They're probably going to hire two people, one scalable, one more administrative within the next few months. And then the third client usually has a team of employees already, but they're catching up all of their employee management stuff into the business that they already have. Mm -hmm. So with this for, for that middle person, which is kind of like, I'm, I feel like I'm ready to hire an employee. I'm not sure what that looks like. I know that I can grow. I probably have a wait list. I have an audience. I know I can capitalize on these relationships, you know, et cetera, et cetera. For you, my first thought was, oh, that's awesome that you're open to creating and altering your offers because oftentimes when we're running profit margin reports on how we're going to serve and fulfill on our offers with our clients based on their new team, the offers are really stringent and structured and it's really hard to get the most out of their team with still really high impact profit margins. So one of the things that I would suggest is maybe saying, okay, so if you have all these certifications, you're kind of like the guru, the expert, the leader, you're going to 
have to create some time and space in your business for you to step into that leadership role and make sure that your people that are representing you that are maybe running your entry level offers are going to be able to really be supported and backed up by you so that you can actually take the time to get to know them, to help them learn, to help them grow and to impart wisdom on them. They are now part of your job. But there is going to be a higher level opportunity where you can take all the education and experience you have, and you are a more high value player in the business. So the way that we teach our our clients this is we basically just take how much time is it going to take for you to make this amount of money? And we take what we're going to pay your employee, let's say $45 an hour, and we say this is what the profit margin looks like when you have an employee that's coming in and working and making this rate, which is a great rate. Let's just assume for this job that we're, you know, I'm making up in my mind that doesn't exist or have a description or roles and responsibilities, but it doesn't really matter because then we take your role and we're like, oh, well, if you're going to continue to do this part of the role that we already know we can give to someone else with just as high of results, we're going to charge $500 an hour for it. So now exponentially, your profit margins are going to increase by hiring somebody else. You're going to make eight times more money by removing yourself from it and putting yourself into an offering that's going to turn your expertise into something that's a little bit more high level. So that's where, and I don't know if you've already do this, but that's where educators or founders will often find themselves in situations to be like, oh, I should be a coach because now I know all of this stuff about how to grow this business because now they're able to take everything that they've learned and push it forth into whatever they're passionate about next. And I think that that is one thing that we need to make sure that we're acknowledging, especially as founders and business owners, is that our roles are not just what's written on paper. Most of our roles are unable to be defined by job duties, job descriptions, and tasks. If anything, we, anything that can be defined, let's delegate that out because what we're doing is creating a much bigger impact. That's making us a lot more money just by existing and showing up for our people and enriching their experience as employees, ideating new offers, figuring out how can I roll these certifications into a VIP service? That's actually going to give me the same margins as the lower level classes that my $45 an hour person is giving me. So you're not costing your company extra money and you've just created a new path for revenue. Wow. Sorry, that was very chatty, but <laughs> hopefully it made sense. <laughs> no, it does. It does make sense. I, I'm like, feel like I should be, uh, luckily this is all <laughs> recorded so I can go back and listen, right? Uh, and take furious notes. I want to I want to talk about uh, the topic of creativity as it relates to, you know, if we're building a business from scratch, if we're thinking about building a business, maybe there's an idea out there. Um this idea of fostering innovation, this idea of being creative, kind of like, I don't know, what's the word disrupting, like the natural or not natural, disrupting the status quo in terms of, yeah. oh, we have to have X, Y, and Z box checked. How mm-hmm. do we get ourselves out of that mindset? How do we create a business that centers around creativity and innovation? You know, I think the biggest thing we can do is lean into the checking of the boxes. So then we can just kind of get all those things out of the way and create plenty of white space to where we aren't like, oh, well, this two hours that I have this week is meant to be creative. Mm -hmm. Like the sooner that we can actually free ourselves of like not only just checking the box, running the payroll or, you know, whatever it is that we're, I just did that. So that's what I'm thinking about, but checking the box and getting that out of our mind frame and getting that out of our system, getting that off our to-do list. And instead starting to think about, I want to make, I need to make sure that I'm freeing up space to pursue what my multi-passionate brain is telling me to go pursue. That's how we can innovate. And once you have a business, you have an amazing vehicle for innovation and disruption. But if you don't have the time to do that, then your business is going to stay middle of the road. It's not going to innovate any further. That's why people that like build these big, huge brands end up not being super involved in them after a while. And then they sort of fade away because Mm -hmm. that founder has now found something else that they're super interested in and that they're trying to pursue. So they're in full maintenance mode, checking off the boxes on the day to day of the business because the business, the system of business out there has taught us to make sure that we're putting things in ways that we can check the boxes so that the founder can go be creative. But in our small businesses, we're not trying to go out and be disruptive outside of our businesses. We're usually trying to do that within the confines of our own organization. And that's what creates long lasting, evolving and innovative brands is when we always have a creative brain in the business. Instead of just trying to trade hours for money and tasks for time, we're also cultivating that within our team 
So even when I'm not thinking about it, I'm getting 85 Slack messages from my lead who's thinking about all these awesome ways that we can capitalize on new trends and new discussions and new platforms through the way that we're serving our clients, whether it be new ideas that are great or some that may need some more development. It's actually our job to to fully foster the environment that isn't just us with the white space, but it's also our people that are trusted that know our mission inside and out. And we can just kind of keep driving their attention towards the overall goal and mission of the business. So then when we are being creative, there is something to show for it at the end of the day. And it encourages more creativity, which leads to more engagement, which leads to a team that never leaves you. So I think it really contributes to an overall feeling of engagement and satisfaction and belonging, which I think we need more of in business anyways, because we got to be at work. So it might as well not suck, you know? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. It might as well not suck. I, (laughs) I wanted to uh, ask you a a little bit more about, I don't really, we didn't actually talk, touch on this yet, but I wanted to hear about your origin story, how you got interested in this line of work and what about this lights you up and inspires you? Yeah, I had a, that's a, a journey, but, um, I started out in corporate sales, did not, was not sold the job as a sales job. I thought I was being a count, going to be a counselor at a university while I figured out what I was going to do with my life. Mm -hmm. Um, while I was working at this horribly toxic company, I got my master's in organizational management. So while I was working there, I, I was able to take what I was studying in my classes and kind of see it from like a high level corporate lens on what was going on day to day in the management of the company. This was like 13, 14 years ago now. Um, And what I, what I ended up doing was getting super burned out, which was my first phase of burnout. And I convinced a bunch of my friends to just quit our job and go travel in Europe for a few months. And when I came back, I was so desperate to not have to go sit in a cubicle again that I started working for a local small business and was you know, I had a master's and I was doing an entry level job. So I got promoted fairly quickly and now am running that organization 10 years later at the COO with a team of seven managers and directors that are doing the job that I was doing by myself five years ago. So over time, I, you know, it took about five years. I ended up having a major mental breakdown and I was doing this, all this work. And of course, now I already told you the end of the story where now there's a team of seven people doing the one job, but I'm sure you can see how I got there when (laughs) at the time I was doing it all by myself, thinking I had to prove every single day as an operations and HR director that I was worthy of my salary for this small business and managing 50 employees and, you know, basically just being put into a bubble that ended up being super toxic. It's all better now. It's That's a story for another day. But essentially I ended up getting so burned out that my body and my mind just completely shut down. And I'd never had delegated anything. I never asked for help. I had already been developing my team, but I never actually gave them anything to do. Um, they, I'm surprised they're still with me now. Some of them for uh, between eight and 10 years. Um, and basically I had this huge, and I don't say this lightly, nervous breakdown had to be medicated, have extra therapy. I had to go on an anti-anxiety medication. It was just when I was getting ready to leave my house one day to go into the office and I just physically couldn't do it. I was so burned out. I was so exhausted. I was so overwhelmed and I wasn't asking for help. And the thing that happened from there is essentially I was unable to be reached. I called my boss, the owner of the company. I was like, I'm actually, I think my mom had to call him. (laughs) She's like non-functional. She can't do it. She's not coming in, figure it out yourself. And immediately just texted my team and was like, I can't, I'm, I'm breaking down. I can't do this. They stepped up and it was like, I was never even gone. It was, no one was any of the wiser, all these things that I thought were all my responsibility, that everything would crumble without me, the pressure I'd put on myself, everything just went flowing like normal because the team actually had the chance to do their freaking jobs. And if anything, they were thankful for it. And it was so humbling and so humiliating. <laughs> but also when you come from a place as a woman who's trying to make it in business and scrappy, you know, trying to get, find your way up. And I didn't want to go back to that corporate environment so badly, but I took a lot of treatment that I shouldn't have. I should have advocated for myself sooner, learned a lot of lessons. But more than that, I had people that were willing to help me and I wasn't giving them the opportunity to do it. And so to have a situation happen where I have this, it, I ended up being diagnosed with PTSD from this incident, which is out. Like it's insane that I would have had such a stressful work environment at a small business that I would be diagnosed with a mental disorder that people get when they go to war. Like it was such a reality check for me that alongside 
your team did everything and nobody cared that you were gone was like, what am I doing? I need to learn how to make sure that I'm giving people every chance they can to succeed. And as a natural leader, I had cultivated a team of people that was ready to go, but I wasn't able to give up that control. And it held me back a lot, but more so, especially over the last few years, as um, I built my own business, I've had to take a really hard look at this at myself, look in the mirror and see what all this is. And now managing a team of these managers and directors that were there with me that whole time has enabled me to build this massive business to really streamline our process. We had all the frameworks in place. I just had to let go. And I just want other people to be able to do the same and to understand that it's the best part of my life is managing my team and building those relationships. It's the best part of my life as an entrepreneur is building my team and having those relationships. And it's often the best part of having a business overall is having people there that are with you and they believe in what you're doing and they care about what you're doing. And, you know, I'm a little passionate about it, but also I just want to save some people from themselves because man, finding out that you've been working yourself to the bone just to realize that everybody was just waiting to do their job is super embarrassing (laughs) when you really look at it. (laughs) And it's no joke to have those mental illnesses that, you know, PTSD is not a joke and it's taken a lot of recovery. And so three years ago when I started Paradigm, that was like the key tenant is like, we're in the middle of the pandemic. I have time to start facilitating some consulting in a more remote way. And it really took off because a lot of small businesses were feeling the same way that I did. And I was successfully able to do it. And then of course, in 2019, two years after all this happened, we got everything ironed out. Our sales went up 30% and we made it through COVID as a small business, which is a rare thing for an in-person business, a small business during that time with super high overhead. So um, I think that it just goes to show that I probably was costing the company money all those years trying to do everything myself too. Don't tell my boss though. You know, I still work there one day a week. (laughs) My lips are sealed. (laughs) Um, So I want to ask you two more questions that, that came up as you were telling your story. And thank you so much for sharing that, by the way, I think that when we can, when we can share things like that, it just gives permission to other people to just be honest with themselves and those around them. And it invites people to ask for help and support, which is so important. You just highlighted that. Um, so I'm wondering, the first question is, I'm wondering if from like breakdown point through recovery and healing process, if you developed any particular habits or, or behaviors or like daily rituals that really helped you remember that lesson, the lessons, the many lessons you learned, I'm sure, and helps you carry it forward into what you do today. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it's hard to pinpoint, but I think when you ask the question, like one of the the kind of gut response was just learning to actually look at whatever the situation is that's really putting you in this space of stress and listening to your body like you are stressed right now the dog is barking. the dog is stressed right now i know she's like let me in there um but when you're getting kind of launched into that place of stress my initial reaction is to literally think about being in your body so it's like what is actually happening versus what is my mind telling me that's happening because what i noticed and what i was taught during therapy during this time is that those are two very different things so the actuality of the stress is that this person didn't show up for work this person is uh, you know, claiming something terrible happened to them or they got sexually harassed, you know, in HR, we deal with a lot of that stuff. This client is screaming at my team. This person is yelling at me on the phone. Our, you know, system is breaking, you know, all these things that are stressing me out when in reality, what's actually happening. Okay. So my initial reaction is I'm very stressed out and I'm about to shut down, but what's actually happening right now is that I just need to make a real quick to-do list and figure out what the most important thing is. The most important thing is always going to be to aid your people. So I'm going to walk over to that situation and I'm going to remove my employee or, you know, if it's digital, digitally remove my employee from a situation that's going to cause them future harm. Mm -hmm. It's my job as a leader and as a boss to protect the people that are around me first and foremost. So really like understanding what your body is telling you, understanding what's actually happening around you and not being afraid to actually say what's really going on and then prioritizing it in alignment with your values. So being really, really clear about what your job is every day will help you to lean into what is actually going to need that attention. And nine times out of 10, you're going to have all these things going on when in actuality, nothing's really that stressful unless somebody's injured or hurt. And that's something that's really important to you, which most people are, you know, I don't want my people feeling injured or hurt. I don't 
don't want my kid to be hurt. I don't want my, you know, I don't want to get in a car accident, you know, whatever the case may be. Most other things are pretty malleable, which means that it's not worth it for us to create a barrier of, you know, inflexibility about our stress revolving around those situations. So I think that as a leader of a company at the time, leading all these different people and reporting to very intense ownership, it was a moment of, I have to actually set this boundary in accordance with what my values are. So if I can't deal with these other four dramas right now, then I have to be able to confidently say, my job is to protect this team first and foremost. So those other four things can and will wait. And that's totally fine. And I think in a business, we're constantly negotiating that with ourselves. But when we're in an unhealthy place, or at least for me, when I'm in an unhealthy mental space, I lose sight of the reality and I get really wrapped up in my own head. And so it just feels like things are piling on and piling on and piling on. So in a weird way, just kind of like taking those five deep breaths, getting into your body and thinking like, what is actually needed from me right now? And how, if I can't figure it out, or it still feels too muddled, lean into what is my purpose? Like, what is my job? What do I allow? What do I not allow? And then create your list of priorities and don't be afraid. We think we have to say yes to everyone all the time, but especially, you know, creating those, that's an easy way or like kind of a a long version way of saying we have to create boundaries within what we're accepting and what we're not accepting. And that's as a business owner too. It's also okay for you to lean into those boundaries as a manager. And it's one of the things that we teach our managers through our training courses and things like that is you just have to be explicit with your boundaries. And it can be something as simple as I know that you need a lot of support with this right now. I, I do have a lot going on today. So I'm going off the grid for the next three hours, but why don't you pick the one thing that I can help you with right now? And then let's circle back and talk about this tomorrow. Like being able to help other people to get into that situation where they're seeing what the real needs are will also take down the level of stress mm -hmm. within your whole business. And I think that those boundaries are really hard to explain when we're dealing with emotional issues and stuff like that, but it really does. And I think boundaries is kind of like an overused word. And I think it's it used incorrectly a lot. Um, my, my therapist, taught me about how uh, boundaries are often used in exchange for avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to check yourself there, but I mean, man, realizing that I didn't have to solve every problem at the same time and just like literally thinking like, what does my body need from me at this moment in order to feel better? Like without trying to just like glaze right over it and solve everything mm -hmm. was a huge learning curve for me. Cause I was like, I'm everything to everyone who needs it when really they didn't even know I was gone. So those other four things didn't matter. And half the time you get to those things, once you have like created the space to have the time for it and somebody else has already solved them, that's better for your team anyway, mm -hmm. you know, but we just have to be able to let, let go and like, let go of that control and just be like, Oh, that system's broken. Well, I don't know. I think I'm not going to be able to get to that tomorrow till tomorrow or the next day, but um, let me know if anything super urgent comes up half the time I walk over and I'm like, Hey, I'm ready to help you with this. And they're like, Oh, we fixed it. <laughs> we Googled it. We solved it. Aren't you proud of me? It's like such a great way to get people to be self-starters and to feel proud of their work and, you know, to help them feel invested too. But we just have so much control going on. At least for me, that was a big one. Yeah. I love that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mic drop. So the short moment. answer is boundaries, you know, but the long answer is, let me tell you my life story. Um <laughs> Please, I, it's fascinating. I love this. Okay. So last question. Um, I'm having a hard time articulating this forewarning, but it's around this idea. Maybe it's just a, a theme or like a topic that I'll, I'll state. And it's around this idea of like, okay, thinking about, for example, I have a nephew who's 21. He's in his junior year of college. He's starting to explore, um, you know, career pathways and stuff like that. So I, and I'm thinking about this in conjunction with like you as offering advice to your younger self, maybe at that stage in your life, or to those of us with children or those of us with loved ones who are at that stage, that jumping off point to launch their career, whether it be the, the career. Well, the reason why I'm asking you this is because it feels to me like there's so much more opportunity and possibility in terms of what one can go do and create for their livelihood than there was when I was graduating from college. Same. Right. Yeah. So it seems like an exciting time for a young person in their early twenties to go and create this life for themselves. I'm wondering what advice you might give to that person. I mean, I guess the, I mean, I'd probably give a lot of advice because that's just basically what I do all day with my young <laughs> yeah. employees. But I think in regards to like where my expertise plays in or how I can back this up with experience and 
stuff like that is just, it's really technical, but it has to do with HR in the workplace in that Mm -hmm. you, as an employee, you don't have to suffer. You are allowed to work in a place that makes you feel comfortable, that helps you learn, that gives you the space to advocate for yourself. You don't have to be miserable. You don't have to be injured. I had an employee come into my office. I go into into the locations once a week. I had one come into the office yesterday, just covered in bruises. And she works in a position that requires her to work with aggressive kids with special and special needs. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it comes with the job, but there's no reason that an employee would have to be covered in bruises every single day from seven 15 to two 15. And I understand that she's passionate about working with this population, stuff like that. But I was like, listen, this is not a, no job is worth physical or mental pain. And I learned that the hard way. And I think I, lo- I lost years on my life because I thought that working meant you have to suffer. Mm-hmm. Sometimes working can just mean a paycheck, but still show up as your best because there's always going to be ways for you to add value to your day. And especially going into the entry level environment. One of my favorite things to do to keep young people and entry level people engaged is just to ask them like, what are you interested? What are you thinking about? How can we facilitate exploration for you in this role? We know it's not permanent. We know you don't want to be here forever, but what are you into? Like, do you want to sit in on interviews with me? Like, do you want to work on our social media? Your business has so many different ways that you can offer uh, value that people can add to their resume and their experience. And if I were younger, I would have just tried to find somebody that would help me to explore those things to figure out what I really liked. Um, and to know that you can do one thing for 10 years and then change to something else. That's totally fine. It's totally fine to do that. Like we don't have to pick something. I mean, I'm a full on millennial, like, you know, right in the cusp of it all. And my mom just expected that I was going to have the same job for my whole life. And I wonder what I would have done differently starting out my career, looking back, um, Mm -hmm. not just in like the, you know, advocating for myself in a good work environment, but also like if I knew I could change my mind, (laughs) you know, like what would I have done differently? So, yeah. Oh God, such good advice. Thank you so much, (laughs) Kira. I love this. So, okay. So ways to connect with you. You have an amazing podcast called on the up and up, Mm -hmm. which so helpful, such great advice. And I just love the enthusiasm that you show up with just, just like you did here. And the consulting company is called paradigm. Mm -hmm. And, um, what's the best way for people to connect with you and find those avenues? Yeah. So Instagram, I'm trying to get more active on, I mean, we're active, but you know, like connecting with more people on there. So if they're listening to this, make sure and let me know you found me through Tessa because I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just like to chat with people about their businesses or whatever's going on, just create real relationships on Instagram. But our website is if you need help for your business, just go to our website, fill out our contact form and we can help you out there. We hopefully when this airs, we have a new quiz that came out. That's all about what your leadership archetype is. So you can actually figure out who you are. And then you get this awesome freebie that is going to be sent right over to you. That tells you like where your leadership type may have some weaknesses that you need to be made aware of, or how you can approach conversations in a different way based on your quiz results. And I mean, it's like my favorite thing I've ever made. So that'll be on our website too. And it's really, really fun. And I'll make sure and share it with you too, so that you could add it to the show notes and stuff. But oh, please, yeah. yeah, I love stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. We all like to, I just, I don't know. There's, I had this really cool mentor, but he's an old white dude. And he taught me like all this passionate stuff about employee engagement and, you know, building a team. And I've been so lucky to work with him. He's like very well known, but I never felt seen or heard by any of the leadership or management resources out there. Because unless you're like, I'm, as I'm teaching other people, like your husband probably feels the same way. It's like, how do you teach something that's innately Mm -hmm. something you understand? Mm -hmm. So kind of like really taking the last few years to investigate that as sort of manifested in this quiz, because we all have different personalities. And that doesn't mean that we have to turn into somebody else in order to be a leader. That's why we have businesses. So we could lean into who we are and our teams will respond to that. But we've never been told that we've always just been told, like, you got to be this way. You got to write these people up and you got to have this handbook and this vacation policy, you know, and we don't. And honestly, like, screw that. So, (laughs) 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 Kira, this has been so fun. You're right. I could keep going. Like we just scratched (laughs) the surface. Thank you so much for your time. And I'll I'll make sure that all of those links get into the show notes and, and just yeah thank you thank you so much thanks for having me 
everyone. That concludes another amazing episode of Outside the Studio. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you learned something new, maybe remembered something old, maybe felt inspired to apply something to your life. My, <laughs> you can hear my dog in the background. She's doing a little happy dance. Um, so Daisy enjoyed it. Anyhow, I wanted to just pop in here to wrap us up to say a couple of things. Number one, I have such an amazing team that helps me put these podcasts together. Without them, I wouldn't you know, be able to bring these amazing conversations to you. So thank you to my producer, my director of creative services, my sound editor, my um, engineer, Consistency Media don't know what I would do without you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the amazing creation and artistic musical genius, Drew Lovern. Thank you so much for putting together this music for specifically for outside the studio. So unique to the show. Only place you're ever going to hear it is right here. Thanks you guys. You make my world go around. Stay well, everyone. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review, share on the socials, especially if it's a show that you think, hey, this could help somebody else. That's what this is all about, right? We're sharing information so that we're better, um, so that we're inspired, so that we're lifting each other up and we're learning how to be in this world, living on this planet to the best of our ability, sharing information and inspiring one another. And that's my hope. That's my hope for the show. Take care.